plate to potential nugget. And moving to a different theme, uh, Tom, you talk about, you know, specifically your experience with biking, you know, where you say you, you tried it for a while and at some stage you stopped having fun and it started feeling like work and you alluded to it at the beginning of this conversation. And you, you also link it to the way we think about identity, right? Uh, somewhere, uh, I'd love for you to talk about the link between some sort of a satisfying mindset and our approach to these pursuits on the side. Can you talk a little bit about specifically maybe relating to your journey with biking? Sure. Yeah. When, when I was around 40, I, I started uh, road cycling, which is a very common um, thing for middle-aged men to do. In fact, there's an acronym. Uh, the word is MAML, which stands for middle-aged man in Lycra, because you often see, um, you know, because cycling is one of these lifetime sports that you can do without, you know, hurting Low your knees or things like this. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. So, um, but I, you know, I sort of got you know, plunged into this world. I, be, I became very uh, excited and sort of intoxicated by it. And at first it was just sort of riding for pleasure. But then I met some people that were, you know, a bit, a bit competitive and I ended up joining uh, an amateur racing team. And the way this is structured is you start out as a category five, and then you work your way down to category one. I mean, if you were, if you were amazing, you would go down to one, but, um, but, but you know, it, it was all very good in the beginning. And I was investing large amounts of time, but it was, it was satisfying and I was, I was gaining fitness and, and had, having new relationships and, and, and you know, having interesting conversations and it just, and, you know, getting out of the house and seeing nature and just nothing but good. But because of that sort of progressive nature of, of, of competition where, you know, what, what happens if you, if you do pretty well in a cat five race is eventually you get sort of bumped up to cat four and then, you're, you're back at the back of the pack again, because you've, you know, you're, you're in a harder uh, zone of competition. So to me, this began to feel like, because this wasn't, again, it wasn't my, my job, I, I but it, it was starting to feel like a job and that the, there were, there were, there were benchmarks I was having to meet. I was, I was having to wake up very early in the morning to, to, you know, go on these training rides. I was, it, it felt just a little too, uh, you know, enforced dietary regimens. And, and at some point the, the pleasure aspect was, was being sacrificed for this drive to, to simply, you know, get, get better and better. And, the, and the, you know, this is something that it's a very natural thing, but I, I, there's a lot of talk out there about mastery and, and expert level performers and the, the, the Anders Ericsson's famous 10,000 hours Mm. Uh, rule of, of deliberate practice to, to achieve, uh, you know, expert level perfection. But, you know, I, I was never under the illusion that I, I was going to, you know, I, I was a 40 year old, I, I, you know, there was, there was no path to professional cycling for me. So it, I, I started to wonder, you know, why am I pushing myself so hard, uh, you know, for this thing that, is meant to, you know, at the end of the day, be, be something that's a, 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 a you know, sort of a, a safety valve for, for the, for the other parts of my life, something that I'm, I'm choosing to spend my leisure time on this thing. So, and, and, you know, other people, you know, probably did not have this experience. They were happy to keep, you know, sort of pushing on. Uh, but I, but I also saw many people sort of fall by the wayside. And so I think, you know, we, we tend to forget sometimes that a lot of this mastery talk we hear, you know, is sort of oriented at professionals or, or expert level performers, not for, Hmm. people people trying to get into something particularly later on in life who might be lucky to have 100 hours to devote to improvement you know not 10,000 hmm. um so um so i sort of you know made a you know sort of walked away you know, stepped back from from cycling and and you know, you know of course a, a cynic might say well you were simply just weren't good enough and i mean there there is that too i mean one one does come up against the Mm. edges of one's per, per, performative quality uh you know and some of this is genetic and some of it is training but um so i you know but i i didn't feel like i i needed to feel bad about that because again it wasn't it was just meant to be a a recreational thing so um so yeah that that's the the saga there and um if right. that answers your question absolutely absolutely uh but you know it, it's just there's a, a point here which you know skill acquisition is is the whole process is sort of a blessing and a curse because it can 
it can sort of go on and on. And, and how, the question is, how good is, is good enough? And do, do, are you always pushing to get better? Is there some level which you're happy to sort of stay where you are? And at that point, is it okay to switch to something else? Are you then, are you then a dilettante or a quitter? Um, you know, and I, I think I probably had some residual guilt about not racing. I felt like I was abandoning something, but then um, I, I decided to just, you know, go, go for, go for other types of expeditions that were more about just having, having fun or some other purpose besides pure competition. I should share a bit of my personal story here. About a decade back, I tore a ligament around my knee while playing tennis. The anterior cruciate ligament to be precise. I decided to go for an arthroscopic surgery to fix it and I was on the recovery path. Thankfully the recovery went broadly well and I wanted to test for myself if I was broadly fit. So I signed up for the 7k walk or run in the standard chartered Mumbai marathon. I was able to run slowly and was able to finish at a slow pace without stopping anywhere. At that time, one of my friends said, why don't you start training for running? He introduced me to a running group near my home and I started training with them. And they would train from 7 to 8 in the morning and this was about 15 minutes away from home. So this basically meant getting up at 6 a.m. and doing this and getting back home by around 8.30 in the morning. I started making decent progress with this group and just like Tom says, they had different categories. Like in karate, they segmented the runners into red, yellow, blue, black and so on. So while I started with an objective of gaining fitness, very quickly I found myself losing sleep over which group I was in and how much I was clocking during my run. I ran my first half marathon in Mumbai and clocked 2 hours and 9 minutes. At that time the rage was sub 2, completing the half marathon under 2 hours. So I got consumed by it and started training towards it and next year I did manage a respectable 1 hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds just under the nick of time at the Mumbai half marathon. That's around the time my second child was born and my daughter started going to play school and that had a certain bus schedule in the morning. Very soon I realized that while I was making decent progress on the running front, I was losing out on sleep. My productivity at work was taking a hit and I wasn't being sensitive to the evolving context in my life. That's when it occurred to me that for whatever I try, I'm not going to be an Eliud Kipchoge and I should think of solving for being fit for purpose rather than trying to shave minutes off the clock beyond a point. I realized that I was trying to inculcate running as a habit and my competitive streak was being unlocked in this pursuit and it was possibly doing me more harm than good as I went down this path. One of my earlier guests, mythologist Devdat Patnaik, spoke about this quite eloquently when he spoke about awareness versus habits on the podcast. See, this concept of habits is a Western idea. It comes... Indian, um, you see, habit is a bad word in Indian philosophy. It's a bad word. Therefore, you are continuous. Another word for habit is conditioned. I'm conditioned to do it. Conditioning, that's a Pavlovian response, right? A dog has a habit of salivating whenever the bell rings. And the West has made it a virtue. Action without thought is habit. Repetitive action without thought is habit. And if you look at the many of the cultures in the West, they are like domesticated animals. At a particular time, they'll get up and run. At a particular time, they'll get up. So there is, it's this kind of a, uh, they are on a treadmill all the time. And this is seen as virtue. You know, driving in the car with a coffee in your hand. Nobody sees in America that this is tragedy. It's a tragedy. You can't enjoy your coffee. You can't enjoy your drive. You have glamorized slavery. You have glamorized slavery and nobody sees it because you are all the Gurujis in their white coats with their chin, uh, what is that called, the fist on the chin photographs, you know, those photographs that you see are telling you, therefore it must be right. Nobody's questioning, what is a habit? And habit has been somehow projected as a good thing. Indian thought is all about awareness. It's all about awareness. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you not doing what you're not doing? And once you're aware, then you realize what is of value to you and what is not of value to you. So you are not in you know, habit, then breaking habits becomes difficult. And then breaking habit becomes, there are good habits, there are bad habits. Habits are good and bad depending on context. 
you know so you will find people behaving in that's why i always find you know when expats come to india they have a tough time because the habit is suddenly in this new context they don't know because oh my god there is no place to run there is no place to oh my god they don't have this thing because the habit right they become the animal you have become like an animal and habit really goes to the lower part of your brain not the upper part of your brain and your habit is about avoiding life you do habits like it's an addiction it's like autopilot it's an autopilot yeah. no and it's addictive like i have a habit of writing but it's addiction if i don't write i get withdrawal symptoms which means i've trained my body to be in pain when i don't do it and to get pleasure when i do it and i'm not aware of it i'm just doing it mechanically so we are an awareness culture awareness 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 not habit culture habit culture empathy goes away I guess a lot of us have come through multiple gates which required us to be on top of a competitive game. That was the only way we could get ahead. So when we get exposed to a hobby without realizing, we get OCD about it and we really start going down the rabbit hole without thinking about the related consequences. It's just worth pausing and reflecting on it as we think about our approach to our various pursuits. This is just one perspective. Some people might argue that this hobby gives them a vent for their aggression and takes the edge of their competitive streak and makes them more even keel at work that's a different perspective as long as you have a clear reason for why you're being competitive and not sort of having a misplaced sense of mastery and expertise in a domain where you're just an amateur it's helpful thank you for listening